Please be seated as I pray. <laughs> Father God, you are a merciful God. There is no question that you are merciful because we are undeserving of any merit from you. We are undeserving of any of your kindness. And your mercy is manifested to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, who went to a cross and suffered for everybody who would believe in him. It is him that we want to remember this morning. We want to remember him well. I pray, Father, that you would attend to us and you would help us as we examine your word. You would allow us by your grace to see your son for who he truly is. And we pray it in his name. Amen. Today, for our time around the Lord's table, we're going to be looking at a passage that helps us see Jesus as the judge. So if you have your Bibles with you, would you turn with me to Revelation chapter 20? We're going to be looking at verse 11. If you don't have a Bible, uh, simply raise your hand. There are some men coming down the aisles. They will get a copy of God's Word to you. If you don't own a Bible for yourself, a hard copy of God's Bible, we encourage you to keep this for yourself so that you can be reading God's Word on a regular basis. Setting here in Revelation 20 is that John is writing to the seven churches in Asia Minor. He's writing to these churches and he's explaining to them the events that will transpire at the end of this age. And he's explaining the events that will inaugurate the next age that is to come. And our setting here in this context is right in the middle of that explanation. In the early part of this chapter, John has explained to us the 1,000 year reign of Jesus on the earth and how at the end of that reign, those that gather together with Satan are destroyed by fire that comes down from heaven in verse 9. And Satan himself is thrown into the lake of fire in verse 10. And what comes next is a judgment. It is one of the most sobering passages in all of Scripture. We see that the judge here is going to be described, and we want to look closely at that judge. And the way to do that is to examine the throne on which this judge works and sits. So as we read verse 11 together... Just take note of what is said about the throne, and we can conclude things about the judge based on that. John writes, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. We see the, the throne described in two ways here in verse 11. The first is that this throne is a great throne. The word here describes something that's massive, something that's substantial, something that has size. And we understand something about the requirements of the one who must sit upon that throne when we look at the end of the verse and we see the response of earth and heaven to the one who sits on that throne. See here that earth and heaven flee from his presence. This is no mortal ruler, this is no mortal judge who's sitting on this throne. This is one who has a substance to himself that is large, is very comprehensive. Next thing we learn about this throne is that this throne is a white throne. What this tells us is that there must be an inherent righteousness and truth and holiness and inerrancy to the one who sits on this throne. We get the idea from reading this throne, that, of reading this passage, that this throne and the one who sits upon it is describing Jesus. We can see that more clearly if we turn in our Bible to Acts, Acts chapter 17. What we're going to see here is what Paul helps us understand about Jesus, the judge. We can see very clearly from this passage that Jesus is the judge who sits on this throne. Paul is speaking to a mob of unbelieving people in Athens. And he's speaking to them and he's explaining God's judgment to them. And he's exhorting them to repent in verse 30. In verse 31, he's explaining that God has fixed a day in which God himself will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world. So there will be a judgment. And he's going to judge that world in righteousness through another one. And that one is a man that he raised from the dead. And we know that at the time of that writing, that the only one that God had raised from the dead was Jesus. So this is clearly talking about Jesus, the judge, sitting on the throne. So Jesus meets the requirement of stature to sit on this throne. And he meets the requirement of 
righteousness to sit on this throne. But Jesus also meets another requirement to sit on this throne, and we see that, and it's implied in the verses that follow. If you read from verse 12 through verse 15, you see one of the most sobering things in all of human history. You see unbelieving man being judged for his sin. We know it's unbelieving man because they're described as the dead in verse 12. Prior to this time, everybody who's alive, all the saints are alive. There are no saints that are dead at this time. So this passage is describing a judgment that's made against unbelieving people. And we see at the end of verse 12 that they're judged according to their deeds. God in his infinite, infallible memory is judging the dead according to their deeds. And the penalty at the end of this, in verse 15, is that these are thrown into a lake of fire. Here's where we, we see what is implied about Jesus himself. God is storing up his wrath on behalf of all of those who do not believe, and he will pour it out for eternity in a lake of fire on those that don't believe. But think about, Christian, what God has done for those who do believe. He has the same vengeance. He has the same wrath. He has the same avenging anger against that sin that's committed by people who do believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord. So God gathered up all of that same wrath, and he poured it out upon Jesus. He compressed it into a period of six hours, poured it out on Jesus as he hung on a cross in the place of every believer who would put their trust and their faith in him as their Savior and their Lord. So on that basis, Jesus met the requirement of experience to sit on this throne of judgment. He's unlike any other ruler or any other judge in human history because every other judge that hands down a life sentence or a death sentence to one who is guilty has no experience of what the consequence of that is like. But Jesus himself does have that experience because he experienced it for six hours hanging on a cross in behalf of everybody who would put their trust in him. So we have a unique Savior. We have a Savior who meets the requirement of stature. We have the Savior who meets the requirement of righteousness. We have the Savior who understands the wrath and the punishment on the basis of his own experience for those who put their trust in him. If you're here this morning and you are a believer and you have put your confidence and your trust in Jesus Christ, we are delighted that you are here. It is our joy to celebrate the Lord's table with you. When the elements come to you, just take them and hold them and ponder the Lord's kindness, the kind of ruler, the kind of judge that he is, his stature to be able to sit on that throne of judgment, his righteousness to actually execute in righteousness a perfect judgment, and then his experience of actually experiencing God's wrath on your behalf when he went to a cross for you. When you've prepared your heart, take the elements on your own. I want to take just a minute to speak to all of those who are here today who have not taken the time to make Jesus Christ their Savior and their Lord in their life. Whether you're the youngest person in this room or you're the oldest person in this room, God is kind in giving you this passage. What he's helping you understand is that there is a danger here. There is a danger in understanding God's patience with you and mistaking that to be God's affirmation that rejection of him is really okay. It's not okay. God will judge in the end. He will judge you. He's giving you the opportunity this morning to come to him in repentance and faith. Come to him and repent and understand that turning from your sin and embracing Christ as your Savior is the only way that you can be spared from the judgment that is in this passage that is coming at the end of this age. So if you are interested in talking with me or any of the other elders or anybody in the row next to you, I encourage you to do that before you leave here today. But men, come and serve us, and I'll close your time in prayer when we're all done.